Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India There's three or four lectures we are going to talk about uh, the food supply chain in India. This is a very important uh, subject because India has uh, uh, 1.2 billion population, 800 million people. They live in villages whose preoccupation is uh, is agriculture, and 50 percent of uh, the employment is in agriculture. And added to that, India has a uh, comparative advantage uh, uh, in terms of agriculture, but this has not been tapped or successfully tapped. So, what we are going to do in the uh, in this uh, two or three lectures is to map the ecosystem for uh, the food supply chain in India and find out what are the uh, uh, pitfalls and how. Uh, they can be improved. So, first uh, what we will do is to basically uh, review the ecosystem <coughs> uh, literature we have done so far and look at the agriculture uh, service ecosystem in India and I will map the food supply chain and uh, we'll look at uh, the institutions, regulatory and social factors because in agriculture in any country is such an important uh, uh, factor, uh, then the governments are always involved and also it is because it involves everyone and in, Indi in particular in India it has a, a lot of uh, uh, about 400 million farmers. So, there are a lot of social factors that are involved. and. Uh, then we also look at what are the resources that are required for agriculture apart from seeds and water, human financial and other resources and how they are managed. And we we'll look at the, the delivery service infrastructure in other words up to the farms and from farms to the customers what are the kind of logistics and, in and IT that are available today. And added to that, we will do the grid framework. That is, is, we have studied how to do the performance of a using the supply chain ecosystem. So we will do the same thing for this supply chain, this food supply chain, and then talk about innovation. Uh, what are the kinds of innovations that are possible in the food supply chain in India? Now we have talked about innovations earlier. The innovations need not have to be uh, new to the uh, new to the world kind of innovations, but which are happening even in agriculture, they are new to the kind of uh, uh, innovations happening. But here we are going to concentrate on new to the market kind of innovations. How India can improve the efficiency of agriculture supply chain? How can it improve its performance and so on? And then we look at what are the risk factors. There are so many risk factors here because if you consider the ecosystem, there is the government, there are the social groups which are basically uh, the factors and there is also a resource uh, crunch and uh, so uh, let us look at all these factors what are causing resources and of course the governance. Governance of small farm agriculture is a very difficult task. So, let us look at what are the kinds of governance structures that are available and then finally conclude it. So, this may take two or three lectures. So, we will see how much we can do in one lecture today. So, let us review the ecosystem as applicable as in general and then let us see how it is can be applied to uh, the uh, agriculture or the food supply chain. So, what is the basic e ecosystem? We have the supply chain. And we have the resources, the institutions and delivery service infrastructure. In other words, here the, the any supply chain 
is, is a very complex interacting system. It, re, it requires resources. It is dependent on uh, the governments, uh, the places where the supply chain is visiting and also it requires logistics, IT and other kinds of infrastructure because they finally the outcome or the, the product of any supply chain is a product or a service and they need to be delivered to the customer. So, so we also looked at uh, what are called the investment climate and we said these three are called the investment climate for the supply chain and the investment climate depends on two things. One is the country where these are this one and also the vertical of the supply chain. So, the investment climate is dependent on these two factors. One is the vertical, another one is the country. And anything that happens, you know, within the supply chain, if you want something to happen, either an innovation or, uh, or a risk transmission, then all these things are involved. In other words, the risk propagates from one to the other and finally it affects the supply chain or there could be conflict between creating the resources and creating the loss. There could be coevolution of the innovation. In other words, one thing, one thing leads to the other. For example, a deregulation may boost up the supply chain and it may create more resources and so on. So, basically anything happening, for example, a creation of a new resource like search, search engines by Google, Yahoo and others that has affected the supply chain in terms of the advertisement and also uh, into, into various other factors like B2B exchanges and so on. So, this basic ecosystem is sort of a very important uh, uh, this one. So, one has to carefully map the ecosystem for the particular uh, vertical or a particular company that is involved. Now, what happens in the global uh, supply chain networks is that these four supply chain and resources in situations and delivery service mechanisms, if you look at in old times, the products produced and integrated locally. So, that is that in other words, you are going to manufacture only for local and even if you are exporting, you are going to export the fully integrated products and vertically integrated local enterprises. So, resources which are used are only for local this one because the enterprise is local and the resources are local and local manufacturing and controlled export. So, basically you can the exports are controlled and manufacturing is all done local. So, the institution the local laws of manufacturing apply like, like labor laws and labor unions and so on. And in terms of the communications, it was paper communications, truck transport and service local deliveries. But what happened with the internet and other outsourcing and others, you have created a global supply chain. Now, global supply chain has transformed this integrated products into modular global supply chain production networks. In other words, here they are modular global production networks. In other words, every product is produced in say 10 different countries. So, it is not produced by any one company in any one country. So, that and then this resources are also globally distributed networks. So, they keep on using the resources. So, this has led to the modularity has led to outsourcing where you are using global resource. In other words, wherever it is low cost, you are going there and trying to reduce, the, uh, to try to produce the products there. And free trade enabled global markets. When this outsourcing has come, then free trade has been enabled by the companies because they wanted investment, they want jobs and they want economic prosperity. And one country after another, this free trade enabled global markets have formed. And of course, the delivery service mechanisms have improved enormously and they are internet enabled 3PLs serving global markets. So, what, what has happened here is all the four factors, this co-evolution here you can see modularity leading to global sourcing to free trade enabling 
and to internet and 3PL logistics and one after another it becomes a cloy evolution here. And similarly, risk of, of any resource like finance will affect the supply chain here. It will make the, the companies, the countries protectionist and it will affect the logistics. Uh, this one and so on. So, we can explain and we have done this earlier I am just reviewing, we can explain the risk propagation as well as the innovation co-evolution into all this. And there could be conflict like you want to create a resource like, uh, like a cluster or you want to allow people free to uh, FDI uh, to uh, FDI in the country and so on. So, there are several things that uh, that uh, can happen in terms of the conflict. So, what we will use is SES framework which is the supply chain ecosystem framework helps us to study four factors. This is called the grip framework although we are going to study this in the, in the risk in the uh, reverse order. It is governance which is how do you govern this globally dis dispersed manufacturing and service integrated system. That is a big problem. So, we have seen that there are several ways you know, it could be a lead player who is doing it or it could be uh, by using uh, the board kind of thing all the members can elect a board and board governed systems or it could be uh, an orchestrator. So, there could be risks which are coming from all the four sides of the supply chain ecosystem. Apart from the supply chain, it can come from resources due to resource crunch or it could come from the governments or it could come be social factors or it could be through the delivery mechanisms. And similarly, innovations can occur in all the four things and the performance is dependent on all four. So, how this depends we already studied, but this we are going to look at these four in for the food supply chain. So, using this you have to do redesign the supply chain. In other words, the, this you map the ecosystem and you study the ecosystem all the four uh, elements of any particular vertical and you do the grip analysis. That grip analysis gives you what? It gives you what is the state of affairs of a particular company of a vertical. Then you could de redesign your supply chain so that it is more efficient. So, high performance supply chains efforts of stakeholders for the last two decades has been highly risk prone. In other words, the high performance supply chains efforts of stakeholders are highly risk prone because they were trying to they were trying to do the supply demand matching, they were trying to do uh, lean uh, manufacturing, they were trying to do JIT and all that. These are high performance all right, but they lead to a lot of risks. And there is a tension between weak and strong ties among the supply chain partners. And when you choose a supplier, a supply chain partner, a logistics provider, you could do either have a permanent account with, with them and share all your information with them, have build up trust, you can mutually finance each other and so on. That is one way that is the strong ties or you can have weak ties, you can go to the market and find out whoever is available, you can use them. So, there are advantages and both advantages of both and ad disadvantages of both. So, you can, you have, there is a tension how to select what. New technologies are creating disruptive innovations. There are lots of new technologies which has come into play, which are GPS, RFID, the sensor networks, uh, the, uh, the, the internet and then there is the big data, there is crowdsourcing uh, and there is the cloud computing. These are all the new technologies which have come into play recently and they are basically causing disruptions. So, you have to basically improve your supply chain design and use these new technologies. And globalization has created long supply chains which are fragile and need monitoring. Once it is global, this one, if it is a local supply chain from Henry Ford Alford Sloan downwards, we have hierarchical or uh, uh, vertically integrated uh, supply chain which is monitored by a hierarchical network. It is a highly bureaucratic network, but still it is monitored and controlled. But when it is a globally dispersed, this one of independent companies, then 
this this becomes fragile and this globalization is monitored global supply chains and governance which involves partner selection coordination and execution takes the center stage so you have everything here but then for any given product who are the who are the partners how do you coordinate who does what and also how do you know whether everything that you have planned is happening so this takes center stage so the supply chain redesign of this we will consider for this example so i'm going to use this we study the food supply chain in india and we model this using uh, the scs framework supply chain ecosystem framework conduct grip analysis and finally present the design of food security network so that's our agenda for uh, the next uh, three lectures so we'll start with uh, mapping the food supply chain so the agri uh, service uh, ecosystem in india what is the agri service ecosystem food and groceries account for the largest share in retail the you know the india is an emerging market and uh, uh, so if you if you look at uh, the uh, retail expenditure in the retail you have food is 59.5 and then comes then comes the uh, others and then there is the clothing which is 3.4 uh, 9.4 and so on so basically beauty and wellness clothing furniture and all this is given here but suffice it to say that market break up by revenues in 2011 it is the food groceries is almost like 60% of the retail in india so food supply chain is an important aspect for the retail industry so in 2011 food and grocery accounted for 59.5 of the total revenues in the retail sector and clothing and fashion followed with a share of 9.9 and in 2011 49.49 of total household income in india was spent on food groceries so you can see the importance of food groceries in in terms of uh, the retail sector in india so what is the food supply chain in india so let's look at what is the service chain or supply chain here it is you start with the suppliers of seeds and fertilizers and so on and there are the farmers who own the farms and or it could be fisheries meat or dairy and so on any of them so these are the categories of the of the farmers that we are considering and their suppliers to uh, this one of various kinds of things of fertilizer seeds uh, uh, pet food and so on and all that and then of course goes into food processing now this food processing the grains if you are talking about uh, the processing of rice or wheat or something then uh, there could be some processing involved i mean there is a not very deep processing happens in india in other words you don't make ready to eat foods in the food processing industry only 5% is done into ready to make eat food kinds of things and then of course packaging and distribution and packaging also uh, in india it is uh, in an early stage but afterwards it goes to retails restaurants and markets so you can see that the service chain from this is called farm to fork kind of supply chain that is the supply chain or service chain that you can see and then comes what are the resources the resources are seeds fertilizers pesticides and so on of course there are banks microfinance cooperative societies which give loans to the to the farmers and there are sourcing hubs and and clusters of uh, various uh, food processing industries and so on there is of course the research and development in terms of how to improve the productivity of the land and also the laboratory testing soil testing and so on you have canals roads water and power because most of this irrigation it requires water i mean the more this one and the water usually comes either from the rivers through canals or it comes through 
uh, uh, through ground water which is which requires power to honor the ground water. So, you have all these kind of resources that are needed here. Now, you these resources are important because if you want to have a, a good supply chain then you require laboratories, laboratory testing the products and so on. And let us look at the uh, service delivery. In other words, here you require most of these if there is temperature sensitive items, then you require cold chain logistics and transportation and of course warehousing and packing. There are food parks, uh, Apeda is the SCJ for agriculture and freight corridors and so on. So, you can add if you want some other some other uh, deliveries here in this mechanisms. So, if you normally these are all the uh, things that we consider for the supply chain that is the supply chain the resources and this, but in the case of food supply chain the institutions play a big role. In, Indo in India, there are several uh, uh, laws which make this supply chain highly complex. What are these laws and why? Because India has a lot of poor people and a lot of people in the rural areas and this is called uh, the 800, 800 million. And so, what the government does is to give them, uh, uh, give them the grains. At, at a cheaper rate. These are called, uh, they have the people who are poor people who are eligible, they have what are called ration cards and for the ration card they get subsidized grains, rice or wheat or kerosene or whatever and kerosene is for, uh, for the staff to use the, uh, uh, to cook the food. And basically you can see there is a way agriculture um, the Committee Act and there is a Minimum Support Price Act and there is contract farming which are regulations and so on. You know India all these farms, farmers are small farmers. There are about 140, 140 million farmers in, this, in India and they are all small farm owners that is maximum is about 2, two hectares and this and remaining 40 people, 40 percent are medium in this one. So, you have these kind of regulations so that the small farmers are protected and you have PDS, PDS is public distribution system. Public distribution system, ration shops and cooperatives, these basically are used to collect the produce from the farmers and so that they can be used in ration shops. Ration shops are the shops in a village or in a city where the grains or, or rations are given to the card holders and so on. So, this they have there is a what is called Food Corporation of India and that basically collects all these grains, processes it and supplies it to the ration shops. So, public distribution system actually that gives some kind of a support price to the farmers which is usually higher than the market price. Then of course, there are quality control, hygiene, waste management issues that are there. You know, hygiene is uh, both for the food and during the, for example, in products like the meat, the milk and so on, it becomes very important because con uh, the, uh, the adulteration or contamination can cause deaths. And of course, there are citizen groups and NGOs because this is because it involves food. So, there are always uh, uh, NGOs who are involved who supply free food to uh, to the school children as well as there are also the citizen groups which are involved which are this one. So, if you, you can see the complexity of uh, uh, the food supply chain here, although it looks uh, just, it's just supply chain which is we normally consider uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in our exercises, we need to consider the resources we need to consider the, uh, uh, the delivery mechanisms and more importantly the regulations from the government and the influence of the social groups in this. Now, you can see how do you deliver a food to the people. I mean one of the resources here 
is the Kirana shop. Kirana shop is a shop in your neighborhood where all these things are available, the rice uh, and other uh, things are all available in the in the shop. So, when they are all available in the shop, uh, these people are small, there are 12 million Kirana shops in India and they become a union and anything you want to do with reference to the distribution of food, you have to basically they get involved. So, they make basically are the citizen groups which are involved in the distribution of food. And similarly, they are hawkers, street hawkers who are they may be illegal, but there are 1.5 to 2 million of them in India and they basically supply food to poorer sections both in urban and rural areas and they have their unions. So, the issue of food supply chain becomes highly complex. So, they are complex systems. So, food supply chains are highly complex interacting networks linking millions of small players like farmers, kirana shops, hawkers, industries, government and other organizations, uh, uh, organizations affecting the political and economic climate. Now, how does it affect the political, political climate? The farmers are, you know, 400 million of them on their vote banks. So, if you try to play with them, then in such a case, then the, the government can go down. And similarly, the economic climate because the farming, the, uh, the GDP, about 13 percent or 14 percent of the GDP is agriculture contributes to uh, to the G to the GDP of India. It used to be almost like 50 percent, but it came now now to the 13, 14 percent, and it basically affects the economic climate. Uh, we should recognize that the complexity of social, political, and operational issues in the food supply chain and the domain knowledge to be acquired. In other words, you should know when you are making laws or when you are de designing a supply chain, you should know what is the kind of things you are dealing with, what is the domain knowledge and the analytics needed to build excellence in strategy execution and mitigate the risk. What is the kind of data you need to collect and what are the decisions you need to make and what is, how do you, how do you make them and so on. So, this this issue, the analytics is becomes uh, an important thing and the appropriate governance structure needed to fulfill the promised deliveries. Mm -hmm. Now, here this uh, the governance structure becomes much more important in the food supply chain case because you have farmers, there are 140 million of them, such a huge one in this country and you are talking of uh, 12 million Kirana shops and so on. These are very large numbers and there are 28 states for the union territories and several civil other groups. So, you have to deal with all this and you need to have a governance structure which is not only professional but also social. In other words, it has to deal with these farmers who speak only the local language. It has to deal with the governments. It has to deal with these uh, associations like farmers association, agriculture association, then you have to deal with the hawkers, you have to deal with the kirana shops and so on. So, basically it becomes socially highly complex issue. So, having having set this map at this, let us look one by one. Let us look at first the food supply chain. The plow to plate supply chain, you have this is the, uh, uh, the farmer, the plow basically they do not use machines yet and this is the distribution where people take it from uh, the village to a mandi or to a marketplace. This is what is called the mandi or a distribution center where or a farmers market where the all these things are all distributed and they are sold to the retailers and so on. And finally, these are the retailers, the street hawkers who basically uh, uh, take it to the streets and they, they deliver it to the house. And finally, this is the food that you probably cook. So, the issue is this is called plow to plate. This is the plow and this is the plate, plow to plate food supply chain. And you can see how efficient or inefficient the supply chain is here. 
In other words, there is lot of manual handling that goes on here. Because of that, there are lots of wastages and 30 percent of the food is wasted away. That is because mostly man manual handling. So, the supply chain involves farmers, seed producers, fertilizers, factories, financial institutions, millers, governments, warehouses, fair price shops, retail shops, railways, truck transport companies, etc., etc. I mean, there are several of these uh, people who are involved. Does anyone orchestrate the relationship among the farmers? In other words, if you ask the question, why is the farmer producing something, tomatoes? or potatoes or something. Has he seen that there is a market requirement for that? Has he seen like other other industries like when you are producing an automobile or when producing a, a two wheeler or four wheeler or whatever. So, in any industry you look at what is the advantage and whether what is the competition and so on. Here is the farmer doing that? The answer is no. Does he know what is the requirement whether it is carrots or potatoes or tomatoes or something? The answer is no. So, how does the farmer know how to sell his produce? So, he thinks he can produce something and then he can sell it. If he cannot sell it, then he will have he will have problems. So, the issue then is can you have demand driven agriculture? The answer is yes, you can have, but it does not exist today. So, what are the inefficiencies? There are 106 million small farmers, 400 million agriculture workers, 12 million Kirana shop, 1.5 million hawkers, and there are too many intermediaries. In other words, fit between the farm and the retail, there are intermediaries who will discuss. You know, if you talk in social network terms, the farmers are in villages, they are not socially connected to the big retailers. They are not members of LinkedIn or social or, or uh, uh, other social networks. So, that creates the problem. So, they have to depend on an intermediary who can take advantage of them. And remember any of this mostly the vegetables, fruits and so on, they are perishable and one has to be careful, they have to be stored in a temperature sensitive places or they have to be transported carefully, but otherwise they will get spoiled. So, because of all these reasons, the intermediacy plays a big role. There is manual reading, uh, handling, improper packing and their standards of IC, these become important and not demand driven, no contract farming. In other words, there is contract farming, but in a less this one and it is not at all demand, you produce something, you you produce cotton because is there demand in the, in the market for this. So, and there is also subsidized pricing, that is because uh, the government tries to procure and so on and there is a public distribution which is inefficient and reach to customers is difficult. Now, reach to customers, customers are the farmers or the retailers, it is very difficult because they are not connected to them. And what about food manufacturing? In other words, in most advanced countries, you will find that raw, raw the, the fruits, vegetables and so on, they are available, but not the major this one. 80 percent almost of the food is processed. Only a small percentage of food produce or meat are processed in India. You will get all raw stuff. Post harvest research and food production testing uh, are, are at a very recent stage. Now, agriculture has two stages. You know, it is from seed to harvesting and from harvesting to to the uh, to the uh, processed food packet. Now, when you when you harvest something, say bananas or something, or any any fruits, vegetables, if you keep it them in sun, then they basically get spoiled very fast. In other words, their lifetime becomes very small. But on the other hand, if you fan them 
or remove the so-called latent heat inside them, then their, their, their lifetime increases. So basically, this is the, there are a lot of post-harvest research for each product. You can have the post-harvest post uh, treatment. But suffice it to say, the product after harvesting has to be carefully stored. If it is temperature, temperature sensitive, it has to be in either conditioned or, or uh, this one. And also, while processing and packaging is becomes very important, it should not get spoiled if there is too much of manual handling. So, that is where the post harvest research becomes an important thing, and that is neglected in India. So, negatives on food magic in India, food packaging is expensive. Why is food packaging expensive? It is expensive because most of the packaging is, is imported and there is a state duty, there is excise duty on the imported packaging, this one. And so, in other words, for, for some things like potato chip packets and so on, it can go anywhere to 20 to 30 percent is packaging cost. And high import duties on processing and packaging machinery. So, you know, their high import duties are processing and packaging machinery, high sales tax on packaged foods because they think packaged foods are the lightest items. High protein food is not available. So, what does this mean? This means processed food is more expensive than freshly cooked food. This is the irony here that which one should be more expensive? freshly cooked food, right, because it is fresh, but processed food is here is, is expensive and this is because of this. So, I mean, although there are packaging factories and laboratories and so on, food packaging is needs an immediate attention here. So, what are the institutions and regulatory and social factors that matter? So, there is Agriculture Produce Marketing Act, which is APMC Act. APMC Act in each state of India requires all agriculture products to be sold only in government regulated markets called mandis. In other words, a farmer cannot sell directly to a retailer like Reliance Fresh or more or, or Food Bazaar or whatever. So, this act has come in because they think that these these big players of the retailers, they basically uh, will uh, they they for they will be hostile to the farmers and try to take advantage of the small players. But that is the APMC Act. In some states, of course, this this has been repelled, but these markets impose sub substantial taxes on buyers in addition to commissions and fees taken by the middleman. So, what this also creates the middleman, these markets impose substantial taxes on buyers and in uh, and addition to commission and so on. Under the present act, the processing industry cannot buy directly from the farmers. And the farmer is also restricted from entering into direct contract with any manufacturer. So, result what happens is because of these acts, all these acts were made to, um, to protect the farmer. So, but this has disintegrated the supply chain basically. So, there are what is let us look at the Mandi. Mandi is what is called the farmers market and the APMC Act which regulates Mandis was amended in many states. And companies still cannot buy, but only can lease fertile land from the farmer. They can buy waste land or lease it. Retailers find it difficult to work directly with the farmers and change the mandi mechanism. The mandis remain more price competitive, all said and done. So, retailers source from mandis instead of developing their own supply chains. So, there, I mean, there, these are the options that uh, people, given the laws, given the social factors. So, the supply chain is as efficient as the Monday. So, th this is the this is the state of affairs of uh, the this one. So, what are the government intervention policies? 
The minimum support price offered by the government for 24 crops acts as an insurance for the farmer against price fluctuations and provides input to the public distribution system. As I said earlier, they said the minimum support price is offered by the government for 24 crops and it, it basically gives more price than a market. The Essential Commodities Act empowers the government to control production, distribution and pricing etc. to secure equilibrium distribution and fair pricing. This restricts interstate movement of goods. In other words, if you they have farms somewhere in India, can you sell anywhere in India? The answer is no. So, the government tries to control the production, distribution and pricing etc. to secure equitable distribution and fair pricing. So, that is another it is not a free market. These regulations may have lost their utility and are hampering the growth and modernization of organized retail. Now, if you if you look at since uh, you know the food and groceries are 60 percent of retail. So, anything you do here in all this, these, these laws are going definitely going to affect the efficiency of the supply chain that you have. So, you have basically if you look at the supply chain and the demand side, you have the demand, I mean you know you, have one, you have to feed 1.2 billion people and you have the supply side, we are going to look at what are the resources that we have and between them or the, here are the farmers, SMEs and other rural industries and you have food processing industries, retail chains, kirana shops but inconsistent policies and poor governance, improper transport facilities, too many intermediaries, they will affect your supply chain. So, you may have seen that how the, the policies of the government or the institutions are affecting the supply chain. This. Now, let us look at the resources and management. So, in the resources has an adv India advantage. You know, India is very lucky to, to have 52 percent of the land is cultivable, whereas the world average is 11 percent. You know, from uh, Himalayas to the southern uh, lands, so southern states, you know, 52 percent of the land is all 15 major climates of the world are in India, snowbound Himalayas to hot, humid southern peninsula. India has 20 agroclimatic regions and 46 of 60 soil types. Sunshine hours and day length ideally suited for year round crop cultivation. Mega center for biodiversity in plants, animals, insects, microorganisms and account for 17 percent of animal, 12 percent of plants and 10 percent of fish genetic resources of the globe. Livestock sector India has 16 percent of cattle, 57 percent of buffaloes, 17 percent of goats and 5 percent of sheep population of the world. So, you can see that nature has been very kind to India. So, there is an India advantage in terms of this one. This is the reason why I was saying that the food supply chain has a comparative advantage. It has the people who, who can do the farming, it has the rivers, it has the ground water. So, basically what is it that is stopping? The inefficiencies, inefficiencies because of the government policies, because of the unawareness of the people and you no know, post harvest research and so on. So, Indian agriculture contributes 13.7 percent of GDP. As I said before, it used to be 50 percent, now it has come to 13.7, 43 billion uh, dollars export and employs 50 percent of the country's workforce. India has more than 160, 106 million small farmer groups and second highest fruits and vegetables producer in the world and second highest producer of milk, fifth largest producer of eggs and sixth largest producer of fish and coal chain is is needed for all these uh, sectors to uh, this and see to feed value driven agriculture. I think the kind of uh, things that uh, India needs today is current scenario is supply driven. The farmer is unaware of the market. 
crop something and tries to sell in a mandi or to an agent or expects a fair price and immediate payment. So, in other words, this is not business like at all because you do not know what is needed, you produce something and that tries to sell. And what is the desirable scenario? A farmer crops to market demand the right or optimal grade of produce and sells to the right customers to get the maximum income. But how does this happen? So, that is the kind of change you have to deal from seed to feed to value driven agriculture and the need to transform the way agriculture works create business orientation among the farming community. So, this is this is basically a social uh, education that one needs to give it to the farmers. So, what about the standards? Standardization is a powerful tool for improving supply chain efficiency. Standards enable partners better compatibility and interoperability of their systems and processes. Standardization of this one, in other words, you know, uh, based on the weather conditions and all that, how do you, how are you going to which crop and how do you produce? And if you want a better uh, tomatoes or apples, how are you going to do the uh, what are the kind of standard practices and so on. So, there are two kinds of standards in the food industry. The food standard that concerns the manufacturing process, content, packaging, etc., for dairy, poultry, and ready to eat foods. In other words, there is a, you know, everything that you eat, whether it is milk or foods or something, they are initially processed, although it is light processing. So, that needs to be standardized. Standardized means what? If you want milk, and if you try to add some some preservatives so that it stays long or it stays in a uh, in uh, in hot weathers and so on, then is it safe? So one need to look at and logistics and IT system standardization concerns cottons, pallets, IT software so that similar transfer of goods and information is possible. So in other words, if if you look at uh, any of these standardized warehouses, where are WMS, uh, this one warehouse management systems, transportation management systems, cartons, all the standard standard sizes, how how these are transported, stored, and so on. What are the temperatures, pressures, and so on? But in India, most of these things are stored in the sun. So that will actually make it uh, spoil and so on. So, basically if you look at um, this one, it is the standards that, that count uh, here. So, if you, uh, if you if you look at what you need to do in terms of uh, the, uh, the resources. So, if you want to use the India advantage then you need to standardize these procedures and that requires a lot of uh, this one. So, that will come to delivery service and then afterwards we are going to look at this one. Let us recap what we are trying to do. What we are trying to do here, we have taken the food supply chain in India. So, what are the big features of this supply chain? You have 120 million or 106 million small farmers less than 2 hectares and there are 400 million workers which has 50 percent of working population you have. You have to feed 800 million people or 1.2 billion people for all this and is the agriculture efficient. In other words, your, uh, there are several problems associated with the cropping patterns and also once you crop something when bring up before it comes to the market, the, the supply chain seems to be efficient. And what are the resources like water? Ground water is basically becoming scarce. The power is basically if you want to use the power to, uh, to either transport water or bring water, bring water up uh, this one to run your motors, then 
that is also becoming very expensive and uh, this one. So, the resources which have been see cheap in the olden days like water, power and so on, they have become scarce. So, it becomes very important that for people to look at look at the agriculture which is a very important thing because uh, you know it, it supplies to food to the humanity to look at how uh, to make this efficient. So, that is why we are first looking at the Indian which Indian supply chain, food supply chain which is an emerging market which has large payers which is important for the country and what are the rules, regulations and the supply chain efficiencies that we have, we have looked at and what are the resources. So, if you look at the Indian resources, they are mind boggling, you have basically everything that you need. The only thing is you have all the resources, your resource management skills are very bad. And second thing is it is the mindset of the government and the people that are involved who are the planners that they are basically concentrate on pre-harvest. They do not concentrate A on food processing industry because if you want to supply nutritious food as we see in the next few le next lecture that then it is a processed food. You have to add vitamins, minerals and so on to the food. One thing is to produce uh, crops with vitamin enriched products like sweet potatoes and all that or you have you can produce grains which are vitamin or mineral enriched. But that kind of research will take a long time to materialize. But what can be done today is you take the grains you have, add vitamins and add minerals so that they become food secure. So, let us look at the, the delivery service infrastructure or what is called also the last mile. In other words, from the farmer to the consumer, what is the kind of infrastructure that we have and what are the uh, problem. So, look at what is since cold chain provides facilities for storage of perishables from origin to point of consumption in order to present pre preserve quality and ensure long life. See the, the, the point is all these uh, products that we have they are perishable. In other words, they get they get spoiled once um, uh, uh, they are not stored properly and so on. So, already the food stuffs are scarce and if they are spoiled then it will be 30 or 40 percent is going to be wasted as now as in India. So, to also it will be low quality. So, to preserve both quality and also longer life you require cold chain. Cold chain infrastructure includes pre-cooling facilities. As I said before if you want if you pre-cool then you are going to increase the life and also cold storage and refrigerated carriers for example, some of the uh, some of the foodstuffs, fruits and so on they have to be used to refrigerate a multimodal transportation either train or, uh, or truck and so on and their information management systems like warehouse management systems use sensor networks like radio frequency identification tags and so on. So, basically if you like if you want to look at the cold chain then cold chain provides facilities for this one it is an important element in agriculture. But uh, these are in short supply in India that is one of the problems that we have. But one of the issues that uh, in India has if you look at uh, any state, any state there are transportation systems available. In other words there are buses from every headquarters, every state uh, capital to the village. So, can these transportation systems, the buses, can they be possible have with uh, air conditioned or temperature sensitive freight car uh, uh, compartments so that they can carry uh, to the villages. One of the problems uh, that one may have is you may not be able to have fuller trucks from each uh, from the each capital to the village and actually the food uh, trucks or they come from the village to the uh, to the capitals because the food is supplied there. So, in, in terms of all this there is some thinking that is needed uh, to make the existing infrastructure 
more friendly to frights. So, what is the distribution of logistics in India? Fragmented. In other words, there are four, uh, two, three truck owners. There are millions of them. Individual company based. The distributions are individual company based. If you have Food Corporation of India, it has uh, 5,000 warehouses. If you take uh, ITC, which is a big company, it has 2,000 warehouses and so on. Technology sophistication minimal. Does these warehouses and others, do they have the warehouse management systems and then temperature sensitive air conditioning and so on? No. Are they integrated into the global supply chain or the supply chain itself? It, the answer is no. So, basically these warehouses are not are used probably for temporary uh, storage of, of their, their products rather than as, uh, as a part of the value chain. So, current attempts to build hard infrastructure, in other words, what are the attempts that people are making today? The attempts are to build hard infrastructure. What is hard infrastructure? Hard infrastructure is roads, warehouses, container fry stations and these kind of things are the hard infrastructure. So, which is asset intensive, which is highly expensive and necessary, but as we saw earlier that the both the efficiency and the time that is taken are of any supply chain are dependent on the soft infrastructure as well. What are the kinds of soft infrastructure that you require? Uh, that is using not only software, trade facilitation, ERP, uh, enterprise resource managed planning systems, uh, warehouse management systems, sensor networks, all these things are the soft infrastructure. You know, when you are transporting goods, if you want to take permissions for the transport, how many forms you have to fill up and how many permissions you need to take for interest, interstate transfer. So, and if you are doing doing the transfer from one place to the Indian in the same state, how many times is the, is, the, is the truck goes from the farm to directly to the, to the Mundi yard? The answer is no. It may have to be uh, it is not even cross docked. Cross docking is, uh, is, not, is not familiar. It is the, the material, the, the material is man ha is handled uh, three or four times and it has changed, it changes three or four track, uh, three or four tracks. So, in the result, there is a lot of manual handling and which spoils the vegetables and this one and so on. So, losses due to theft spoilage, goods damage due to manual handling, long lead times and resultant supply chain inefficiencies. So, the supply chain becomes highly inefficient because of the uh, uh, this manual handling and long lead times and so on. And India ranks 46 on the 212 logistics performance index. I mean, you have all these performance indices that uh, uh, that uh, where uh, countries are ranked and India of course ranks uh, pretty low in terms of in terms of 46 in terms of the logistics performance index. Now the performance index depends on several factors and it basically depends on uh, the infrastructure mainly and also number of players who are involved. How many third party logistics players, how many people with trucks and the trucks also what is the condition of their trucks. In other words, are they old trucks or something. So, basically you have to look at uh, uh, what is the state of uh, the, the equipment as well as uh, uh, the other assets, logistics assets and uh, their technological technology enablement is used or uh, if they, you have a warehouse is it air conditioned is it temporary is it temperature sensitive does it use forklifts uh, it is automatic uh, material handling and does it have RFID tags and so on to, so that you can basically find out uh, whether a particular item is there or you have to go somebody has to go on searching for it. So, what are the losses in the warehouse? So, there are several several 
uh, issues which are involved. So, what are the challenges facing the retail sector? Unavailability of logistics companies offering back end support for retailers. So, if you are a retailer, right or right it be cold or other things, you require two things. One is shop shopping mall space and second thing is the warehouse space to store goods the place and also uh, there you you don't want to do it yourself you are a retailer so so the back end support you need some logistics company to do it i mean you could do the logistics yourself but it will going to be very expensive so refrigerator transport and warehouse facilities timely distribution of supplies to retail outlets and the lack of efficient and organized supply chain management leading to higher costs it leads to higher costs and complexity of sourcing and planning for retailers so if you are a retailer it becomes your sourcing becomes very complex so what are you what are you sourcing from where are you sourcing from you have to source if it is fruits and vegetables from a mandi and who is going to transport from mandi to your retail shop there is no logistics players uh, which are who have reputation so you have to hire a truck or something and then this negotiation becomes ever every day big, uh, this one and planning for retailers hence no hence to the consumers i mean after all retailers are intermediaries they are going to pass it on to the consumer so why is this high, high cost coming up the high cost is coming up why this because of uh, inefficiencies in this Unavailability of sufficiently skilled and trained manpower leads to trail under management in retail operations. So everybody thinks he can sell, he can procure, and so on. But the unavailability of uh, the skilled manpower it goes into it basically takes it basically leads to uh, trail and error management. So one thing is to comply that uh, the uh, the roads are not there, or the warehouse management and other things are used, and so on. But are you using the existing facilities fruitfully? Are you using the existing facilities as they are to this? So the answer is no. Take advantage of the vast network and logistic capabilities of the existing institutions. There are several institutions here. Post office. There are 160,000 post offices. Almost every village has a has a post office. So, what is a post office? It's a basically a letter delivery as well as it is also a bank. So, is it possible to use the post office as a delivery mechanism? They deliver parcels. Is it possible to ship something if they, somebody wants to ship something to a village retailer? Is it possible to send it by the road transport bus to the post office and the post office will deliver it to the retailer or retailer will collect from the post office and there are several banks, bank branches, etc. So, is it host of services that can be given by using the existing infrastructure? So, we are not trying to use the innovations. So, we are not trying to innovate using the existing, how to use the existing infrastructure to provide a new and valuable services to the populations. Because if you are a retailer in a village, his requirements are low. He does not require big trucks to supply. Certainly, uh, a passenger bus with an air conditioned compartment can supply the goods that are needed to the village and uh, the bus passes through several villages. So, it has an advantage if it has a, a freight compartment. So, the issue is are we thinking about this? Do not wait for the infrastructure to be available and you said start to use the existing facilities more fruitfully. In other words, it will be highly inefficient to wait for the exist to the infrastructure to be to be available because infrastructure is asset intensive and capital intensive it takes a long 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 time for the infrastructure to be available in the fashion that you require what about food safety in housing 
need to assure cons consumers about safety and quality of the food. Food safety is important and the sanitary and phytosanitary SPS agreement under WTO has led to increasing recognition and adoption of food safety measures. In other words, at the point of entry into the, into the country, not at the point of departure in your country, at the point of entry into the country, the foodstuffs should satisfy SPS agreement. So, if they do not, the food will be returned. So, a, a food that is rejected by a country, why should it return? You have to basically dump it somewhere. So, it, it becomes very, very important that you follow these regulations, otherwise countries can reject. Compliance with international food standards is a prerequisite, prerequisite to gain higher share of the world trade. Food standards are important, concerns on food steps on the back on food safety on the back of breakout diseases such as BSC, avian influenza, bird flu, etc. Particularly for meat eaters, this becomes um, uh, very important too in terms of the food safety. Because in terms of avian influenza or bird flu or something, by the time it is recognized that there is bird flu in your, in your birds, you could have sold a lot of meat which could have infected the people. So, one has to be extremely careful going on consumer demand for a products which are healthy. So, there is a uh, this one. So, the food standards becomes and hygiene becomes important. So, if you look at the, the food supply chain in India, very if you want to do this one, it, it is highly inefficient. We have gone through the ecosystem. We have gone through the supply chain, we have gone through the resources, we have gone through the institutions and we have gone through the delivery mechanisms and the conclusion is it is very inefficient, needs good governance, needs food processing industry, needs cone chain logistics, needs of course immediate attention because it affects the entire country. So, with this we will stop here and then uh, continue later.